My name is Alexi, and welcome back to Garage Technologies. First of all, I want to thank everyone who has supported my channel. Thanks for not forgetting about me. I got some news for you. I started getting a lot of doubts while reading your comments. Some people want me to shoot at a closer distance, and some want a wider angle. I've already made two videos, and everyone has some kind of problem with them. Okay. I think I need to compromise here and try to film my stuff differently. I was about to make a new video, and then I got a torrent of more criticism. As soon as I addressed those questions, I got more negative comments again. It all seemed like an exercise in futility, and I felt like Don Quixote fighting with the windmills. So far, I am going to stick to my ways. I've promised you a Gravaflyer blueprint, and I'm going to share it with you. But my video is going to be long, because I'll have to insert video clips from other sources to prove it to you how real my work is. I am not a delusional psychotic, and I am not making anything up, so I'll be adding extra material which will support my line of thinking. You know, faith is based on knowledge, knowledge is based on facts, and facts can be very complicated things. I am sure everyone will agree with this statement. That's it. Also, I'd like to introduce you to the theory behind my blueprints and my whole path. I'll try to explain my thinking process to you and support it with the actual facts from this other material. I realize everyone has doubts about the nature of this research. You wouldn't have a firm grasp on reality unless you were also able to doubt things. I am not blaming anybody, and I do realize this model seems too good to be true. This is why my statements need to be supported by facts. So today's video is going to be rather long, I am afraid. It's not going to be easy to explain all of it in a concise manner. It's okay to skip some parts of it and go to the blueprint straight away. But if you want to understand the philosophy behind my work, it's necessary to at least listen to some theoretical parts. I'll try to give you as much detail as possible about my latest research and my theories. Please be patient and let's get started. What is gravity of itself? Many scientists have tried to theorize about this phenomenon. Really, you can explain gravity in two words. Gravity is a force which attracts us to the Earth. That's all. How does it manifest? It manifests in many ways. Or, simply speaking, it pulls us down to the Earth. As simple as that. There are several ways to affect this force. Low temperature is one of them. I've already shown you how magnets can fly in a low-temperature environment in one of my videos. Then, special electromagnetic fields can affect the Earth's gravitational waves. And there is the third factor. Properly selected sound oscillation frequencies can affect solid matter. All of this was proven back in antiquity. Ancient Egyptians created sound waves to build their pyramids via giant trumpet-like devices, thereby solid matter, would change its mass. I am sure you've heard about the Coral Castle. It's made of megaton blocks, and it was constructed by just one man. He took his secrets to his grave. It's pretty obvious to me he was using sound vibrations during his work to lift the stones for his structure. Let's talk about the fourth factor. Electrically charged elementary particles become lighter. I'm going to show you how this works in a future video. Factor 5. Creating anti-gravity waves can also manifest levitation. Factor 6. Frequency properties measurement of the subject itself. We know that gravity is an interplay between frequencies. Factor 7. Neutralization of gravitational currents. Now let's look at several of the above-mentioned factors. When I began revising all those principles, I went back to the models of some very well-known inventors like Schauberger, Searle, Charles. And what did I discover? I saw many analogies. I saw that they all were using the same physical principles to make their devices. Namely, the nature of their models is practically identical. Radial rotation of magnetic or electromagnetic fields is always involved in their work. You know, even the Nazi Bell experiment during the Third Reich era also featured two rotating cylinders. Schauberger also used two rotating discs, just like the Nazi Bell project. What phenomenon exactly are we looking at here? Okay, 
Let's us begin unraveling all of this. When I went back to both Charles and Searle, I honed in on one little interesting detail. They were working with basically the same principle. But many people confuse Charles with Searle. Some say it's the same individual. Sorry, guys. John Charles passed away and Searle is still around. Right. So how did it all begin? At the age of 14, Charles joined a factory as an electrician apprentice in Birmingham, England. Working with permanent magnets for electric meters led him to discover a new law in electromechanics in 1946. I'll describe it to you. A fast rotating disc creates a radially moving force which involves a vertical vector. He began magnetizing his discs in order to boost this force. Then he started using permanent magnets. For example, Searle used several rings while Charles had his discs. One day his model, which consisted of several rings, joined together got tested in a backyard. The radial direction of the rings showed a large discrepancy, which ended up affecting the nature and cracking sound of the electrical charge even at a slow speed. The smell of ozone was felt. Something really strange happened next. The component with the rings fell off. It kept moving like a motor and started levitating at 1.5 meter height. It kept rotating faster and faster continuously. The object began to glow with rose-colored light. This indicates that the air began to get activated and the pressure dropped. The object began to lift off. There was another unusual phenomenon. The radio signal stopped. All radio devices were off. Finally, the object began to rotate at a totally incredible speed and disappeared. Charles got very inspired by his experiments. He constructed and tested over 10 models of levitating disks from 1950 to 1952. Later, he figured how to control the speed of his disks. Now, it's important to remember this very significant detail. A fast rotating radial disk can create an electromotive force involving a vertical vector. You just need to memorize this fact. Schauberger used this principle as well when we look at his models. They were operating on the same principle. Their models just differ a little. I haven't seen Charles's model, but we'll look at Schauberger's work closer. I made my disc according to his model. Charles got a lot of media exposure in the 80s. He was hailed as the creator of the flying saucers, but later it all suddenly stopped. It was as if someone had issued a specific order to put an end to this information release. Then he just passed away. I'd also like to mention Vladimir Roshin and Sergei Godin, two Moscow-born guys, who decided to check out Charles's discoveries. They decided to visit and interview him. Interview him they did. Unfortunately, this interview took place in a prison. He flat out refused to tell them his secrets. But they never gave up and focused on their own path. They did build their own free energy generator. By the way, their machine weighed 350 kilograms and produced 10 kilowatts of power. No fuel was necessary at all, and its weight would decrease once it began rotating. Okay, enough of history for now. I need to go back to my own disc. How did I begin constructing my model? I studied Searle and Schauberger and began my own work. What physical properties does this device manifest? What makes it levitate? A three-section condenser is the first analogy that comes to mind. It means that these plates must get charged when the power is on. I'd like to show you a device I came across once. It's an experiment about what charged particles can do to an object. Let me show you one video. It's well worth a look. You'll see that a charged object begins to lose its mass in this video. Let's watch how it happens. Radiation, or rather saturation of a liquid sample inside a glass vial, is the purpose of this experiment. It's balanced on laboratory scales. I'm going to use my electroforming kit to saturate the liquid sample with static electromagnetic energy. We'll observe its reaction to a gravitational field. Now we are testing the sample. The exposure to the energy has been very brief, so we didn't detect any drastic deviation from the norm, but a prolonged saturation of the sample results in a significant loss of mass. I'll have to time it to show you that more time is necessary. 
Time is essential to create more charged particles for an anti-gravity field which will interact with the Earth's gravitational field. This measurement will suffice, and you can see that the electroforming kit has been moved away. How much time has elapsed? We need to put that down. The sample is clearly manifesting its anti-gravity properties against the Earth's gravitational field. Now we can observe this effect. If we charged a solid aggregate sample, the power would build up even more. In other words, the solidity of the charge will increase. This principle could be used to build flying machines to lift and move cargo in the outer space. Now you've seen the video. Let's draw our own conclusions. It's pretty obvious that a charged object loses its mass. Electromagnetic fields which surround the object partially influence the gravity. But it's not enough for us because we need to make the object levitate. We need to create an electromagnetic field with a closed circulating current so that gravitational waves can enclose it. A bit off topic, but I am sure you've heard of anomalous zones spread around the whole planet. The laws of gravity tend to bend in such places. The Earth seems to create those electromagnetic anomalies naturally. You can Google such locations easily. Why do rotating disks create this phenomenon? This is how it works. The disks begin to form a field around themselves when we charge them with a lot of power. Mechanical rotation of the disks turns this field into a toroidal vortex. What prevents the vortex from getting dispersed? Each vortex has different potential. We keep the lower vortex charged negatively and the upper vortex charged positively. I used my middle disk to prevent the vortex from dispersing. I kept it charged with an HV generator. The charge is pulsating so that my two toroidal whirlwinds remain stable. The magnets attached to them increase the power. When charging the disks with high voltage currents, I experimented with the frequencies and watched the effect on the toroidal vortices. The vortices curled around each other and created two toroidal whirlwinds. I need to mention Grabenikov again. He mentioned those donut or pretzel-shaped machines. So his device was creating the very same toroidal vortices. But his way was different. He used a different principle. Although, in a sense, his model was different, but he used the same principle. Sorry, I got a little confused. Okay. I selected the charge on the HV generator, and this made the fields pulsate at the frequencies when gravitational waves become warped. Let's look at insects. They can create such electromagnetic fields around their bodies. Look at the body of an insect on the screen, and note how electrical charges are dispersed. Or look at how electrical charges are dispersed around our planet. I'll show you the picture so we can take a closer look now. What are we looking at? It's the same three-rayed asymmetrical condenser. Or else we got an asymmetrical condenser with three sections. The body of a beetle mirrors the same three plates used in a disc made by Schauberger. Both operate on the same principle in order to levitate. This is how those anti-gravity cocoons are formed which envelop those anti-gravity waves. It's also worth mentioning that beetles use electricity in combination with the sound waves. Here you go. Beetles' bodies produce levitation through a mixture of sound vibrations and an electrostatic charge. Schauberger's machine is based on the same analogy. There's only one difference. It levitated through a direction vector created in his rotating disks. This diagram indicates that the motor consists of screws, similar to those used in helicopters. In reality, this is all disinformation. Schauberger considered screws to be outdated for high-speed aircraft. He suggested using special membranes instead of screws for his flying machines. Those membranes were thin, metallic plates powered by electrical magnets. The engine was based on a phone switchboard. This is why first flying machines looked like discs. And beetles create vibrations with their lower wings. The same law is at work here even though the result can be achieved by different ways. One analogy unites all these different ideas and methods. You can see this analogy when you study both Beetle's wings and the Schauberger machine. There are sound waves inside of electromagnetic fields. I mean, those waves create a certain effect. This effect was recreated by Hutchinson. I'll show you a video now. Let's keep in mind one thing. He used a combination of waves created by a Tesla transformer. He influenced them with sound vibrations. This was his method. He also used a van der Graaff generator. Let's learn more tidbits from the following video. John Hutchinson, the inventor. Gravity is a very complicated phenomenon. 
Many scientists and amateur enthusiasts have found this to be especially true. John Hutchinson, a Canadian physicist and inventor, made a new scientific discovery by studying Tesla's longitudinal waves and using a high-voltage Van der Graaff generator in 1979. A Van der Graaff generator can create a charge of up to 7 million volts. The power is created by electrically charging a moving dialectical tape. The current isn't very strong. Even a child can touch the generator safely. Two or more Tesla coils create interference between longitudinal waves, which could make a 32-kilogram object levitate. Ice cream and keys would get stuck to the ceiling. Various materials, woods, metal objects would become fused together or melted down and exploded. Massive steel rods would spontaneously break like pieces of paper. The video evidence we have left almost crosses into the paranormal. Right now, we are watching one of his garage experiments. You can see John regulate his electromagnetic radiation frequency settings. He intends to radiate random objects. Hutchinson never made a secret that he viewed his work as a direct continuation of Tesla's experiments. He had carefully studied everything left behind by Tesla. Yet his results far exceeded his expectations and challenged our very notions of gravity, space, and time. After Searle made his discoveries, many independent researchers all came to the same conclusion. An electromagnetic field of a certain frequencies can create a particular environment where gravity is absent, while matter, time, and space change their properties. Okay, let's summarize what we've just learned. We can clearly outline four important principles. None of it is a product of my own imagination. These very real discoveries were made by very real people. You got names like Charles, Searle, Schauberger. All right, let's delineate them all. Cyrillic text on screen. An electromagnetic field of a certain frequency can create an environment where gravity is absent. 2. An interference between longitudinal waves made by two or more Tesla coils neutralizes gravitational waves. 3. A fast rotating radial magnetic field creates a force which involves a vertical vector. 4. Sound vibrations of proper frequencies can make objects levitate. My Graviflyer is built on those fundamental principles. I omitted to mention a few other things. The cavity structural effect, lattice-based structures like graphene, etc. But that's another whole story. Let's not mention the superconductivity associated with low temperatures. This phenomenon is quite real, but it involves a lot of hard work and it's less difficult. This method isn't very convenient for us. Let's memorize those four laws and we're going to base our work on them. Now let's move to the most interesting part and actually get to the practical side of things. We'll take a look at my blueprint and I'll explain how it all works. I had promised this and I finally got to talk about the blueprint in this video. Thank you for your patience. Let's get to it now. Here you go. Here's the blueprint in front of you, friends. What are we looking at? You can see it consists of three parts. Here's the impulse part with the HV generator. Here's the power part. And here's the low voltage part. Now we'll talk about each part and explain how they work. We need the power part to charge those disks with a high voltage current. Here we can see the regulator itself with a power supply unit. Here we got the current. Here we got the regulator. Here we got the power supply for the flyback transformer. Although we can alter the design a bit too. It's not necessary to make it too complicated. A push-pull design based on two colors could work too. But I chose something quite simple. Next, we have the flyback transformer and the multiplier, but the multiplier is welded underneath the bottom part of the disc. What does this part give us? The plus charge goes to the upper part. The minus charge goes to the lower part. This is connected to the fact that the Earth also has two polarities. The Earth is charged negatively, and the ionosphere is charged positively, plus. Minus repels minus. A negative charge is repelled by the Earth. Magnets work according to the same law. Although the magnets don't repel each other here, we are getting something else. Let me explain. Why do we need the HV generator? We know that the HV generator creates an impulse for this transformer, but if we place a wire there, the impulse will get transferred to the middle disc via that wire. What results are we going to get with this? When the motors start rotating and we power them up with a high voltage current, what are we going to get? We are going to get two toroidal vortices, they are going to swirl in different directions. But this HV generator connected to the middle disc is going to prevent those vortices from canceling each other out. 
See, here we got the plus charge and here we got the minus charge. They can neutralize each other. As for the impulses they create, there is a constant impulse output, which creates a certain effect which prevents those two toroidal vortices from dispersing. What's the purpose of the ultrasound part? Here's the battery. Here's the regulator. Here's another one. And here's the ultrasound generator. I showed a video where Hutchinson sent longitudinal waves towards various objects which levitated as a result, but those were high-frequency waves. I decided not to work with longitudinal waves. I am getting an impulse from my HV generator, but my high-frequency waves are created by the ultrasound generator here. Here I installed some piezoelectric material. It's in the upper part of my disc. The entire design is quite diminutive. This model can fit in a cap, and all the regulators are taken outside the design. There's one low-voltage regulator with one wire in this model, but it has four cables attached to it. This supplies the power for the motors and this design above. Then, the power gets distributed between the motors and the ultrasound generator. The motors are responsible for making the discs rotate in different directions. This is identical to the model Schauberger designed. Yet his model is different too. So what's the nature of this disc? In essence, it's an electro-forming machine in a horizontal position. But Schauberger had two longitudinal brushes, which got rid of the electrical charge during rotation and transformed it into electrons and positrons. His whole machine was powered by this positron current. An object charged with positrons acquires levitation properties. Do you remember the video? Any object also powered by electrons can lose its mass. What does this mean to us? It means that the Earth's gravitational waves are warped and circumvented. Let's look at the system model now. The disks are rotating. Those two motors power two disks. Two toroidal vortices are created. The middle disk keeps the vortices from dispersing. It has a neutralizing effect, and gravitational waves envelop it. Gravitational waves are just a condensed form of ether. It has a larger density despite the fact that we can't feel it. This is why all our planets are round. They are pressurized by this immense density. Have you ever thought why the planets were round? I mentioned this in one of my videos on anti-gravity theory. They are round because the ether pressurizes them, and everybody with lesser density will shrink into one direction. It will always shrink towards lesser density. It's a universal law which can explain the nature of gravity. We become subject to the law of centrifugal movement if the object doesn't shrink. That's when all the classical laws of physics work. The centrifugal force of the Earth will eject the object as far as possible. I hope this part is clear now. Let's move on to the next segment. Here we got magnets. There are six magnets laid out in this manner. Why six? Why not four, eight, nine? Take a look. We'll get a honeycomb structure if we connect every dot within the circle. Remember how Grabenikov said those honeycomb shapes radiated something like a lighthouse of frequency waves? So our lines create an electromagnetic field of sorts with a wave-like direction. Look at how I place my magnets. The north is up, the south is down. A sub-zero current flows to the south. This creates a certain effect. I can't fully explain it because I haven't figured everything out myself yet. I am doing my best to relate my experiences. Please, don't be angry if something I say doesn't make sense to you. I have my limitations. It's fine if you disagree with me. I am just trying to explain my point of view here. Why do we need this ultrasound part? Remember how Hutchinson experimented with longitudinal waves? He directed his emitter towards the objects and they levitated. The video mentioned how those emitters were projecting high-frequency impulses. An object would change its frequency properties once under the influence of those energies. This made them levitate. As you can see, my blueprint combines a lot of different parts and ideas. My path seems too complicated, although I am quite sure that an anti-gravity system can be much simpler. The Earth crust can produce those anomalies that bend the laws of classical physics without any complex electronics. This piezoelectric emitter, it's been assembled as a part of the disk, creates enough ultrasound for this entire system. It radiates this whole apparatus with high frequencies. The HV generator also creates a high-frequency impulse. Now we need to create a resonance with those parts of the design. Creating this resonance is a real pain in the ass, guys. Those of you who worked with paraboloid antennae know how horizontal and vertical surfaces need to get polarized. The transformer needs its settings adjusted, etc., etc. We got the same problems here, if not worse. 
We need to harmonize the frequency from the HV generator from the middle disc with those toroidal vortices right here while keeping them powered up. Meantime, it's necessary to keep the discs magnetized and regulated because the condenser is getting electrically charged. If the charge gets too high or low, our parameters fail. So the gravitational waves pass through the system and collapse it instead of enveloping it. If we manage to synchronize gravitational waves in order to have those fields resonate with each other, those waves will end up circumnavigating the system, and the whole electronic model will work. This is how we can get this gravitational effect. Yes, my method seems too complicated. This model may be worth trying if you have access to the metal the disks are made of. Remember how Grabenikov once discovered that an uneven, rough surface can warp a magnetic field around them with an electrical current? Remember beetles' wings? The lower wing can create an electrostatic charge when the beetle is flapping it. This wing has many holes and little hairs. The hairs act as electricity conductors. Nay, my system is a little different from his model, you see. His two discs made of this particular metal resemble those beetles a lot. It's not the flapping wing that creates a charge, but the HV generator which creates an impulse. It is the source of electrostatic charge. Plus, those ultrasound waves get radiated. All of it combined, we can create a phenomenon when the Earth's gravitational field bends around the model. Trying this out will pay off when you got access to this metal. Don't worry, please. I've already begun building a new disc. I am using a simple piece of metal as you can see for yourself. I didn't use that special metal. I made this out of regular DVD discs. But I got two magnetic fields. I distributed them in the same fashion as before. I want to select the right properties for this disc. It's going to be much easier for you to make it if I succeed in making it levitate. I am still working on developing this device, so let's go back to our blueprint. So now you have it. I don't know if you guys are interested in assembling the whole thing. Please note that I am not responsible in case of your failure. This blueprint will be totally useless to you if you fail to find the right metal and your parameters are off. You really need to take certain things into consideration. Adjusting the settings is a topic for another video. I hope you enjoyed the video. I intend to talk more about Grabenikov, and I've already started constructing my Graviflyer. I've had access to Grabenikov's archives. I aim to base my research on all sorts of sources. I'm also going to talk more about Ignatov's inventions. You probably never heard this name. He also worked on anti-gravity devices, but he was using different principles. His model was very simple, but I'll take this up in another video. It's been a long presentation, and you must be tired by now. Well, I've given you the basics. There's still some stuff I need to figure out for myself. I tried to explain my work to you to the best of my ability, and I do have my limitations. I hope you enjoyed this. You're welcome to ask me questions. Leave comments, likes, dislikes, whatever. I got a feeling this video will attract negativity, but it's best to ignore the trolls. Wishing you all the best, friends, and thank you for your support. I'll continue my research and I want to try to make the new disc levitate. It's much simpler to design and the metal is easier to come by. Hopefully I'll find the right settings for it. Bye for now. It's been Alexi and Garage Technologies.